beginning at verse 29. 23, uh, 23rd chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 29. Uh, I'll just say this to you. Jesus is laying it hard and heavy here on the hypocritical religious leaders of his day. And this is this is what the context of these verses are about. The Pharisees and the scribes, and he is just really laying it on them because they're not being what they should be. Verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you are witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which kill the prophets. For fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. You servants, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? My message is that title. The damnation of hell. The writers of the Gospels tell us many things about the ministry of Jesus. They tell us what he did, and we also read about what he said. <laughs> and we're amazed as we consider these ancient writings, we're amazed at how Jesus takes a little boy's lunch yes. and turns it into an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> and then have 12 baskets left over. They, they, they ended up in leftovers with more than what they started with. We also read about how he calmed the storm and conquered the raging sea. And how one day he interrupts a funeral. Now if there's some things you don't want to interrupt, it's a funeral. But Jesus interrupts a graveside procession. They're taking this young man out to bury him. Jesus is walking by. His mama crying. The boys, the deceased mama is, uh, the boy's mama is crying. Jesus is walking by. All right. He says, stop. I'm going to do something. And oh, did he ever do something. Amen. Walked up to them who was carrying the body. Just touched it. And said, I say to you, rise. I'm gone. I'm out of there. But that's what he did. That's what he did. When he was approached by the Roman centurion, the Roman centurion had a servant who was sick. And he said, Jesus, would you, would you come to my house and heal my servant? Jesus said, I'd be glad to. Then the centurion thought about it for a minute. And he said, Lord, now that I think about it, you really don't have to come to my 
heard Joel Osteen preach on that. <laughs> I've never heard a lot of these popular TV evangelists preach on hell. Because sometimes they say, yes, well, people already know. And I beg to differ. Now, that's not something I think you got to preach about every week. I'm not talking about that. But, but it is something that Jesus taught about. It is something that Jesus preached about. It is something that the Bible mentions many times. And, 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 and I would not be faithful as a servant of God if, if I didn't talk about it sometimes. Here in Matthew 23, what we have here is Jesus' last public sermon. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is his last public message. And it's aimed at the false religious leaders in Israel. All right. In verses 1 through 7, he warns the people about these false religious leaders. In verses 8 through 12, he tells his disciples and other true spiritual leaders, he says, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Listen, just because a person pastors a huge church, Amen. that doesn't necessarily mean they're a righteous teacher. Amen. Let's not get caught up in the numbers. Doesn't always mean they're doing everything right. And you already know in recent months, there's been publicity about certain preachers of some of these mega churches Amen. who are in some hot water. Amen. Some of these guys... The wives leaving them? Amen. Um, some of them are caught up in <laughs> caught up in stuff they ain't got no business caught up in. Amen. Messing with boys Amen. or girls. All right. Got no business doing that stuff. And I'm going to tell you this. You can accuse me all you want. If I ain't done nothing, I ain't paying nothing. I don't care. No. No, no, no. Not going to do that. So Jesus says here, to these false religious leaders, and he really condemns them, and, and he ain't holding nothing back. He calls them servants, snakes, slithering around with your poison and with your lies. He calls them a generation of vipers. And he asked that question again. How are you going to escape the damnation of hell? But, you know, that's a good question. How are you going to escape the damnation of hell? Vipers are small snakes. They're not very long at all. And when they are still, when they are still, they look like dried twigs. That's what they look like. And so often in the days of the Bible, when people would gather firewood, they would inadvertently pick up a viper because of the way they look. And many times they were bitten and died. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 28, the Apostle Paul was out gathering firewood, and as he reached down and picked up what he thought was a twig, it was a viper. 
and bit it. And the people who were with Paul just kind of stood there and said, uh-oh, he gone. <laughs> he done. And they stood there to wait to see how Paul was going to start convulsing and start shaking and foaming at the mouth and falling on the ground and crying out in agony and pain. They were waiting to see him do that. And when the snake bit him, Paul just said, get off of me. Right. Just shook it off. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean like some of these dumb churches. And it's dumb to bring snakes and to go playing around with them in the service. And if they bite you, you're going to be okay. That's stupid. <laughs> that ain't got nothing to do with faith. That's just plum foolishness. <laughs> <laughs> Would you hand your child a little jar of nitro and say, here baby, throw this around a little bit? No! You wouldn't do that. And you wouldn't test God either. Right, exactly. By handling poisonous snakes. That's taking a passage of scripture and just doing it a disservice. Not, not what God intended. So vipers had a reputation of being deadly and deceitful. Yes. And so Jesus says to all of the false religious leaders and followers, how should you escape the damnation of hell? Let me say three things about that real quick and I'll be through. First of all, it's important that you understand hell is a real place. Yeah. Secondly, Satan is a real being. And Jesus is a real Savior. Did you get that? Hell is a real place. Satan is a real being. And Jesus is a real Savior. The Bible clearly teaches that hell is a real place. Luke 16.23 lets us know that it is a place of torment. Matthew 25.46 describes it as a place of everlasting punishment. And Revelation 20, verse 15, describes it as a lake of fire. So, make no mistake about it. Hell is real, and hell is hot. And I don't care how hot it gets in the summer, it ain't hot as hell. <laughs> In the parable that Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus, remember that story? The rich man asked Abraham, he said, Father Abraham. Now remember, the rich man and Lazarus both dies, right? Lazarus ends up in a place of comfort, in paradise, in a place the Bible calls Abraham's bosom. Which, which basically represents the place of peace and comfort, the place where those who have done God's will and serve God and live for God, that's where we will be in, in paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there's, 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 there's the, there's the uh, uh, poor man, the beggar Lazarus, there with Abraham, and then we hear and we see the rich man being tormented in hell. Two distinct places. Both people. 
people are very much alive and very much aware of what's going on around them. So whoever says to you when you die it's all over, that's a lie. No, it's not all over. It, it really has only begun when you die. It's really just begun. And so the rich man says to Abraham, now see, you would think somebody in hell would learn their lesson. <laughs> he still ain't learned his lesson. Here this rich guy is still trying to order somebody around. <laughs> tell Lazarus. He told Abraham to tell Lazarus. <laughs> Buddy, you ain't in no position to tell nobody nothing. <laughs> Tell Lazarus to just dip the tip of his finger into some water and let it touch my tongue. Just a drop. Because I'm being tormented in this place. Why would Jesus tell a story like that? Because hell is real. Amen. It's real. But get this. The rich man didn't end up in hell by what he did. See, we think all oh, these wicked, horrible people who do these horrible things, they're going to bust hell wide open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Understand this. The rich man doesn't end up in hell by what he does. He ends up in hell by what he doesn't do. That's right. That's right. That's right. If you end up lost forever, separated from God, it's not because of what you did. It's because of what you didn't do. You didn't humble yourself. You didn't seek God. You didn't come to Him on His terms. You didn't repent of your sin. And thus, you end up in that awful, horrendous place. In fact, the Bible says God is not willing that anybody go there. Amen. It's not God's will. Well, I just don't believe God will send me to hell. He don't. <laughs> you send yourself special delivery. <laughs> God don't send folks to hell. Look, the Bible says in John chapter 3 that we are already condemned. We're already condemned. The judgment has been passed. We are already condemned. But, praise be to God, by the power of Jesus Christ, that condemnation is removed. And so the Bible says, there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say for those who know about Jesus. For those who stand on in Sunday morning and sing songs about Jesus. Those who are in. That signifies a position. I'm in Christ. He's in me, I am no longer condemned. So I can stand before him faultless and blameless. And it's not because of what I did, but it's because of what he did for me. What he did for me. Satan has deceived so many people into thinking that hell ain't going to be all that bad. <laughs> you ever heard people talk like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think living on this earth is hell. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm catching all kinds of hell. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't cussing, okay? Uh, <laughs> hell is not something you catch. <laughs> so God 
I ain't throwing. <laughs> All right? Amen. Hell is a real place yes. that God desires you not to go to. Amen. He desires you not to go to. So for those who think that, that hell is not all that bad of a place, have you forgotten that Satan is a liar? Why are you believing the lie of the devil? He is the one who has put that thought in your mind. It ain't all that bad. Satan's saying, I'm here. So that simply means you want to be with him then, right? No, you don't. You don't want to be with him. He is a liar. He lied to Adam and Eve, and because they believed his lie, their perfect world was plunged into the darkness of sin. Now, not only is hell a real place, but Satan is a real being. When Jesus was beginning his ministry, the Bible says he was tempted of the devil. Unbelievers are blinded by the devil. And the Bible teaches that we should be on guard against the devil. And we read in the Bible where people were possessed by the devil. One of the things Satan has been so successful at is to convince people not to take him seriously. He's been very successful at that. To convince people not to take him seriously. And so, there are people who think that he runs around in a red devil suit <laughs> with a pitchfork. There was this little character years and years ago when I was growing up in a little comic book called Hot Stuff. Yes. He's a little devil. <laughs> and, and, and he had on, you know, he was red and horns out his head and had a tail with a point on it and all these weird, weird looking kind of things. <coughs> Folks, let me, let me tell you, that's not what the devil looks like. Uh -huh. So sometimes the devil comes in a three-piece suit. Sharp as all get it. Driving a nice car. Looking good, ladies. Flashing a few dollars. He comes in all kinds of clever disguises. And guess what, y'all? He has only one goal in mind. And that is to take as many souls to hell as he possibly can. That's his only goal. That's his only goal. Take as many as he possibly can. I urge you today, don't let him take yours. Don't let him take yours. Last thing. Last thing. We said already, the hell is real. A real place. Satan is a real being. Now here's the good news. Jesus is a real Satan. Amen. He's a real Savior. In fact, he's the only Savior. Acts chapter 4, Acts 4 verse 12 says this. says, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You want to be saved? There's only one name. What's that name? Jesus. What's that name? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. That's the only name. His name alone means salvation. Amen. That's what his name means. 
The angel said, you shall call his name what? Jesus. Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. Can't nobody else save your soul from a burning hell but Jesus. Nobody else. That's why I like saying that song, Can't Nobody. Do me like Jesus. First John 419 says this, and now close. Says this. We love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. Yes. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing. It's words, it sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest thing on earth. Oh, how I